Good evening and uh, warm welcome to our online conversation, Giving Up Has No Future. I'm Barbara Unmüssig. I'm the president of Heinrich Böll Foundation. Giving Up Has No Future, this is a very special project of Heinrich Böll Foundation, a so-called scroll story on our website. And there you find animated and very moving and touching portraits of three very courageous people who are active, have been active in the democracy movements in Egypt, Tunisia, and um, Mona Al Saif, Rami Rouili, and, and Ola Al Khwendi will talk about their experience in the Arab revolutions and also in on the um, experience 10 years after the Arab rebellion. Today we will um, have them on behalf of all the courageous people who very often risk their life for democracy and freedom and continue to do so. The author of the scroll story, Mohammed Amjahid, will then lead you through the digital story and will explain how, it, uh, how these stories came about and uh, how we could win them to present uh, the story on our website. 10 years ago, we could witness uh, a historical moment from Morocco to Bahrain, people rose up, thousands of them, and very loudly and courageously fought for their rights and their freedom. And this um, um, uprising gave us courage here in Europe and made us euphoric. And uh, there was a lot of hope um, to bring about new social contracts in uh, the Arab world. It gave hope for social rights and democracy and um, less corruption. And today, 10 years later, we uh, should not only draw a um, dire conclusion, even though uh, there seems to be an, a terrible situation in Syria and elsewhere. It, Assisi is uh, ruling Egypt very ruthlessly and more ruthless than Mubarak. There are tens of thousands imprisoned in Morocco and Jordan. The uh, kingdoms um, extended their authoritarian rule in the last 10 years. Nevertheless, in Tunisia, the political situation has changed uh, more basically, and in Iraq and Lebanon and Sudan, 2019, new protest movement got started in Sudan. There is hope for more democracy and freedom. Everything has to be um, negotiated, but and we can never talk of democratic breakthroughs, but still these democratic movements give us hope uh, that the people uh, will keep fighting for their freedom and dignity. The discourse um, today is uh, shaped, uh, unfortunately, that uh, they are seen as a center of terrorism and a danger for the European neighborhood uh, that we belong to in Germany. So. Um, it um, leads a lot to uh, instability and uh, Europe, in my opinion, this should be the message and it's my deep conviction should move away from this uh, false picture of instable democracy. The only thing that's stable is uh, a repression and poverty of uh, the population and the causes uh, that brought the people in 2011 to protest have not gone away. M people risk their lives because uh, they want to have uh, a life in freedom and dignity. Germany and the EU should change their policies vis-a-vis -vis these autocracies and not just support these regimes with billions of support. And in Europe, in my opinion, 
uh, Europe is losing credibility because they don't stand for the people and the human rights uh, which uh, supposedly belong um, to the European Union, to their value system. Giving up has no future, uh, tells a story of Mona Said, whose family has uh, been shaped and characterized by political imprisonment. And she uh, um, had to, uh, instead of fleeing to Sweden, she is teaching um, people in uh, camps in Syria, in immigration camps, and Raoul Rami Kauli and uh, has been working on uh, in the democratic movement since 2011. And his story also shows that it's a very difficult process. Mohamed Amajid has collected the stories of Mona, Ola and Rami and um, wrote about them. And I think it gave me courage on especially the um, illustrations of uh, Mona. And I would like to thank uh, Mohamed and Aljana, Mona, Ola and Rami, all three of them who sh have shown a lot of courage in telling their stories. And uh, that shows me that especially in Egypt, uh, they are very much uh, in danger and I'm very grateful that uh, they were prepared to work with us in the project and I also thank my colleagues in the Heinrich Böll Foundation who um, have uh, did some pioneer work with this wonderful scroll story and Lukas Fischer, Lisa Kreuzer and the MENA team especially Anja Hoffmann um, get my thanks uh, for this really moving project. And once again, my uh, great thanks uh, and um, Mona, Ola and Rami. And I'm very happy to uh, welcome you tonight in the Heinrich Böll Foundation. It's very nice that you can be with us on this evening and uh, together with us, uh, you can uh, praise uh, the heroes in the MENA movement in your region. We are behind you, we support you because this is the, the topic of the Skoll story, giving up has no future. And uh, we all wish that your fight, your struggle for a life in dignity and with human rights can be successful. And I wish that you can um, live in complete freedom and thank you for your courage and uh, your fight for democracy and uh, human rights and freedom. Thank you and I pass the floor to Mohammed. Thank you. Many thanks Barbara Unmüssig for the welcome and, and your words and uh, thank you also to the Heinrich Böll Foundation for, invitation, for the invitation and uh, the possibility to uh, get, let us have this discussion, but before I switch to Arabic and continue the discussion in Arabic, I want to say to the German listeners, if you are on YouTube, if you're on the YouTube channel and watching, are watching the live stream, there you find the Zoom link. And uh, because if you want to follow in English and German, you can only do it on Zoom. So please follow the link there in the video description, YouTube will be Arabized tonight and therefore you can follow the event in Arabic and also um, in uh, Zoom as well in all three languages. Thank you again, Barbara uh, Umusig. Well, and, uh, uh, thanks again for the invitation. Uh, my name is Mohammed Amjahid and I'm a German from uh, uh, Moroccan background, don't be scared, I'm going to adjust my language so that everyone could understand me well. 
I just have received an email from Anya Hoffman, uh, uh, takes care of the North African uh, Department and Heinrich Bull Organization. And she asked me if I would like to join her and her colleagues uh, to work on one journalistic uh, project uh, about the development in the area. Of course, I said yes. And uh, we uh, tried to think over how could we clarify the picture, the current picture in uh, the different countries in the area. and. Uh, how how to uh, support all those activists for dignity, justice, uh, social justice, and uh, human justice. And so we have prepared this uh, file. And uh, let us have a look here. The, the, the file uh, is a journalist file that contains uh, contains stories about three activists from Tunisia, Egypt, and Syria. We have a technical question here. This is Philip and he is fixing it. Thank you, Philip. Let us have a look now at the left and it will be in both English, Arabic, and German as well. By clicking, by clicking on the different languages, there is an Arabic and you have to click on it and there is the file. The, fly, the file has three different uh, sections about Rami uh, and uh, uh, from, from Egypt, Mona and Ola Arjundi. Each one is going to elaborate on these things and uh, uh, we are uh, talking about all the societies that existed and facing the uh, uh, rudimentary changes even before 2012. You can read all the stories and all the narrative uh, by clicking on the link that's presented to you here and the, the, the link would be written somewhere here and uh, you can access it in both English, German and Arabic. Uh, the artist who did uh, all this artwork is a Syrian artist uh, and she will join us this evening. And now, a question, could, could I ask our, uh, our guests, all three of them to turn the cameras on now? I uh, welcome the three exceptional exceptional guests from Syria to uh, Lebanon and the Tunisian and uh, uh, notwithstanding the restrictions of the Corona situation. Now we are meeting across uh, uh, virtually a meeting and I am delighted to be able to welcome to be welcome the jurist, uh, commentator and the political activist from Tunisia, Rami Khouli. Welcome to you, Rami, and thank you. The activist teacher, teacher, uh, in, in the neighborhood of uh, of Hama, uh, Ms. Ola Al Jundi, and she is now in Lebanon. Hello, hello, and thank you. Welcome. And uh, we have uh, a scientist and a researcher, researcher in cancer, and a jurist and activist, Mona C from Cairo. Mona, welcome, Mona. And my first question to you, Mona, is unfortunately. Unfortunately, your brother Abdul Fattah, who is an activist, a political activist, and your sister, your sister who is a filmmaker, both of them uh, uh, dwell in jail, uh, and the Egyptian system regime accused them of uh, different uh, accusations. So, what is the current situation now? Starting in two thousand nineteen, my my brother volume up. In 2013, Ala has been lingering in jail and he was under intensive uh, observation. Currently, he is in a high, high security, security uh, in Torah, and in Torah, uh, he, is, he is 
he belongs to the national security violations and all his human rights and all of them in the group, all of them, even they can't have access to radio, to phones, to hot water, and even the visits are under extremely difficult situation. There is a glass warrior there and we have to keep shouting through it and we have protested and we have presented appeals and there is nothing, no positive result. Unfortunately, in the last few years, Years, the issue of the Security Council and the allegations of Security Councils uh, reached new uh, dimensions. My sister Sana has been in jail since June, and the reason being that uh, during the corona and restrictions, we tried to, to we try to keep regular correspondence and the connections and the contacts with uh, the brother Ala, and, the, and we tried she was arrested and she was and now she is uh, in detention and uh, again uh, her, her uh, she was accused by uh, by uh, terrorism and uh, now in Torah in Torah everything of course is cooked up to uh, be a, a case against her Mona we thank you and uh, I think we are going to hear more about Allah and the Sana brothers and sisters this evening but uh, just a, a simple a brief note here for our audience, uh, for audience when uh, you are on Zoom, you can put, you can uh, present any question in any language, English, Arabic, German, uh, the way you like, and we will try to uh, forward all these questions to our guests here. I would like, I would like, uh, I would like to address Ola Al Jundi now from Lebanon. Ola, Ola, you are working on a project to supporting children in in the Beka region, the, in the Lebanese Valley, Beka Valley. Why and how come you choose or to dedicate all your life for all these years in order to build a school for children? Of course. And the, the stories are detailed. Uh, I will be in writing, but I would like to hear from you. How did you come up with this idea? And uh, where did you get all this uh, energy to uh, put your efforts to support the children? In 2013, when I came to Lebanon for the first time, I was working like all those who came to Lebanon uh, volunteering, volunteering uh, on my own will, supporting and offering help and the aid administrative, uh, uh, basically to refugees who live in the camps. I had two, two children, they were my own. Uh, and, and in 2013, there was no education for Syrians in Lebanon. And so we would, uh, we would go and offer our uh, efforts as volunteers. We would see other children there who were out of schools and they are getting to be uh, to be illiterate more and more progressively so in in Palestine they used to know how to read and write and then in Syria they could not read neither read nor, nor write and so my own children Moreover, they were aware, excessively aware of this situation because they knew that education, education is a basic instrument here, but the main reason why I continued into this effort is that I believe that a part of what happened to us in Syria, what we suffered in Syria, the lack of knowledge, about the uh, mechanisms and the, and the, 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 the modus operandi and the how you do uh, things, things that we did, could not do during the revolution. And these are things that are connected to education because when we start working in schools, in, in our schools, we learn how to say yes to everything. We don't think on taking initiatives. So I have seen that this is an opportunity in order to learn and pick up new things, new things to start working in education with children in Syria. Because the background here is that there was no education in Syria. There was another opportunity and a chance to implement new ideas about free education. Thank you, Ola. Ola, could you probably later, you could talk to us more about your daily uh, schedule, daily life uh, with the children. And then my question now is to Rami Khoili in Tunisia. In the dialogue that you would see uh, uh, in our files, you did criticize the policy, the policy of setting up priorities and trying to create a balance, 
checks and the balances in Tunisia after the revolution in, of uh, 2011 in Syria in order to create a certain balance and a certain stability um, for example, uh, to stand up to the different uh, conservative parties in Tunisia. Please explain to us the difference between the infrastructure, the political infrastructure, and the, the groups that suffer of distinguishing. Mohammed, the revolution, the revolution had very clear, clear, clear um, uh, calls and motives: uh, dignity and liberty and and. Uh, all over the Republic of Tunisia, but but as in every political, every movement uh, worldwide of political changes, uh, there was uh, 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 there will be a sort of identity conflicts and identity differences and the variances, uh, particularly between the conservative, the Islamist uh, uh, groups uh, who tried to try to change the, uh, the nature of the Tunisian society uh, by supporting the, denying, denying the support to uh, minorities and, and uh, uh, homosexuals and uh, feminists. However, this was a historical opportunity for us that That, that the legal rights and the female rights that were presented offered us the first time to move, offered us a space in which could we move and try to achieve the, uh, uh, the uh, targets of our efforts. Rami, thank you. And I had a question that I wanted to uh, throw uh, out later, but now after I listened to what you said and the, the fact that the, 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 the reality are living in the different countries, and I get the feeling that this is an important question. Here in the West and Germany particularly, we would like, we would like to move to Tunisia, Jordan, uh, Morocco, and the, the rest uh, of the whole thing. We tended to, we tended to think that it is a homogenic area and the all this area is just uh, just a, a prototype and so when we asked you to three from the different different way what is your comment and the feeling the question uh, i know that it is uh, your situation mona is totally different in syria or different than tunisia And we could talk very comfortably because uh, we, it is in the family now as we are talking. Well, uh, let me start. Uh, please go ahead. It's uh, quite strange that uh, yes, some people put us all in one bag as if we all are uh, are the same, but uh, uh, and that we are different only in our view and on on the situation that we are living. But as a matter of fact, there is uh, uh, there is there is something that goes above and beyond the situation we are living. No one could deny that the Tunis Tunisian revolution uh, offered us in Egypt a big push forward, uh, teaching us and uh, guiding us how to work with the twenty first deal with January 25th in a different manner and different approach that did not exist in the past. In Syria, uh, later on, it was the same situation. So there is something, something here that in the last 10 years, the struggles that we have been going through in different societies is a common ground. And everyone was thinking that uh, uh, the neighbors could learn from us here. And if you talk to many Egyptians, we will think that uh, we will think that the achievement, the major achievement that we did is that we are going to take from other people. And then we would look at uh, Yemen and we would look at uh, Sudan and what happens there. And we would think that, and we ask ourselves what sort of did we commit in that regard? And then I would like to add something uh, about our generation and the following generation. Don't, uh, for example, when we watch what is going in America and we see the Black Lives Matter movement, there is something, a common denominator here that goes above 
and the beyond the differences between the ethnic groups and the people. And we think that we all are, are uh, moving in the same direction. And the, anything anyone would take in that, in that direction is uh, offering a general support to all of us here. Sh thank you, Mona. Uh, Rami or Ola, would you have anything to uh, add to this? Maybe, just maybe. I do agree totally of what Ola said. So uh, geographically speaking, yes, so we are one area. Historically, uh, in terms of general culture and civilization, social structures of our societies, of course, uh, there are uh, there are deep rooted differences here. But uh, but when we talk about uh, when we talk about uh, revolution or movement or protest, uh, we we. We would see that there is something general here. Maybe, maybe what happens in Algeria and what happens in Sudan uh, lately, uh, and the other movements in the area. Maybe, maybe, maybe uh, the movement was seen as a successful, successful uh, example, uh, and. Uh, what happened in Tunisia was successful, and the one could always compare what happened in Tunisia to other uh, other places like Syria uh, or whatever. And then the thing is, but in Syria disintegrated and they reached a, a civil war. But uh, but this does not mean that one people is better than the other. For there are a lot of given uh, here, as I mentioned, historical historical uh, backgrounds and. Uh, other strategical, maybe maybe elements in the Tunisian revolution being considered as the first revolution, one could get himself organized to deal with the revolution uh, in such a manner that we can benefit from uh, what went on. Thank you. Yes, I would like to add just a little comment. We have many things in common and maybe the most important one is what Muna mentioned is how the beginnings of revolutions in Tunisia and Egypt um, posted a turning point, a historical turning point for the people, not only in those two countries, but in other countries as well, specifically in Syria. Um, people started to move and to organize and to um, be um, uh, move together toward uh, common goals. But there is something we need to pay attention to, something that is very different between these revolutions. It's the beginning, the starting point. There is the democracy and the um, nature of movements at the starting um, of the revolutions, which resulted in very different types of revolutions. Um, there is the mo civil movement in Tunisia is very different from what um, took place then in Egypt. And then especially um, it uh, stands in stark contrast to what happened in Syria. Also, the mass organizations and coordinations have taken different forms. I also see that the level of violence that has been practiced against um, the people who took to the streets was very different in shape and then hence um, drove the revolutions on very different tracks. In Syria, we had a dream and we still do have this dream um, to um, um, conduct uh, certain activities that do represent um, the ideas that we hold as activists and um, as um, uh, people taking part in the revolution to take control of the public spaces is essential as truly essential in revolutions. It's very important. It opens up opportunities to organize oneself um, in different ways. I also feel that there are other differences such as the interference of states within the revolutions and um, also the regional actors. I think these are um, technicalities that um, eventually affect the trajectory on which these revolutions move and so we stand at very different points after 10 years. Thank you, Orlu. I think that this analysis is that in 2011, it was a historic moment. Um, I think this is what you all have in common. 
at the same time, I would like to talk to you now about um, where we stand today. Um, so I would like to go back to Mona Saif. Um, Mona, could you um, please tell us more about your daily life? What does the struggle of an activist um, look like to free your family from detention? Your family has been agonized to an extent that is very difficult for us to imagine. Where do you take the strength from day after day to keep up the struggle? First of all, where do I take my strength from is very difficult to answer. I just feel that I do not have a choice. That means that does not mean that I'm just compelled to do this or obliged. It means that there has been a moment um, which is uh, for survival. It's um, for me and my family, I need to survive. Any opportunity that I can grasp, I will take to survive. There is, um, I have changed the way I've dealt with things in the last years. Um, it was um, brutal. There was a lot of brutality and it was um, very difficult, but despite of everything, and I am sure all detainees feel the same, that there has always been this feeling that we try to move on with our life and that we just want to manage our lives to have this feeling of normalcy as if we were just um, keeping on walking until this life gets back to us at some point. This was my feeling at the beginning when Ala has been um, sentenced to five years and serving the sentence in prison. But um, when he was um, released, we thought that um, we thought our family life could be something that we can get back again. Um, but in reality, we were very surprised when he was detained again and in a deteriorated situation and the brutality and the violence that uh, was practiced against my family. And especially now um, my sister is also detained. She has been detained um, twice before, um, more than two years in total um, in sentence. Um, that is why when you introduced me um, as a researcher in cancer and genetics, I had to laugh because I have stopped. Um, of, um, I do not exist anymore as a researcher. I am an activist. I gave up all other roles. I just want to free my brother and my sister. I cannot see myself in any other role than being the sister that fights for her family. And I do not have any other priority than to free my siblings. And this is a journey that I have embarked on. And um, there are many um, voices and stories of families who go through very similar stories such as ours. And so I do believe um, that that um, who has a husband, um, a loved one in a detention center in prison um, will not only look at oneself, but there are also friends and lawyers and um, young people um, who support one. And all of these people um, are lives. Um, and um, we meet these people at the doors of prisons and all of them are connected to people who are inside prisons and these are connected lives and this also um, unites us in the hopes that we all wish that our siblings are freed. But Mona, um, the detention of Ala and Sana without reason arbitrarily and then they are detained a second and a third time. Does this not um, confuse you or frustrate you? Um, what exactly is it that you do so that you tell yourself, OK, I can um, go into some sort of a communication with this regime, with this system? What is your daily strategy for survival? First, I think um, um, there are moments, but there's one um, main reason we have been now for many years um, struggling. The Sisi regime is um, trying to choke and stop any sort of activist movements and to get rid of any dissidents and opposition and any related movements. And um, there, of course, they did not um, shy away from any sort of brutality against activists. 
but they do not wait for reasons to act. That means that the current regime wants to be in full control of the public life in Egypt and of, or better say, to unite the rhetoric. So any, any person who wants to have a free voice, an individual voice, um, has no chance. There has been doctors who has been detained uh, during Corona times, during the pandemic. Um, there have been um, the family members of um, uh, people being treated at hospitals who have complained about the regime who were all detained. So people are being detained for a sentence, they say. For example, the TikTok um, girls, which was inter that their um, aim is to entertain. So what I'm saying is that any citizen who wants to preserve his freedom of expression for the on the simplest matters um, for the regime, this person is considered an activist and hence it's justifiable for the system to um, practice its brutality on those individuals. What I do um, is that since I started to um, be part of the revolutions is that I try to gather, remember, and share my stories and to use the platforms together with all the others who have stories. So when I'm in front of the prison, I share my story. I share the stories of the people I meet there, of the family members of the others. I talk about the things that I go through and I live and I try to document um, what exactly is happening to us. And um, we tr of course, all the media um, platforms are officially blocked by the state. So I try to, um, to get my story through and to also um, share my stories with those who um, go through similar things, similar stories. Thank you, Mona. Um, dear um, audience, you are you can still post your questions on Zoom um, through Q&A, uh, depending on the language of the program you use, you'll see um, the option at the bottom of your screen. Um, I will go into the questions you're posting after a few minutes, um, but I still have a question for Ola Al-Jundi. Um, no doubt that the situation in Syria is beyond troubling. Um, so after all these years of wars and this inhumane response of the regime, you at the same time are very close to Syria living in Lebanon. How, what is your stance? How do you look at your country after all these 10 years? And when you hear the news, um, what do you think? I did not um, understand or did not hear your question. I apologize. My question is when you read the news on Syria, this disturbing news, what do you feel? And you're very close geographically speaking to Syria. You live in Lebanon. Um, you could just um, go take a car and be in Syria after a few hours. Um, so what are your feelings when you um, hear of the stories and the news and the events taking place under the Assad regime? Um, I, can, I could reach Damascus in less than an hour. The first time that I was close to the borders, there was only 20 minutes between me and reaching Damascus. So between me and my country, there's half an hour and a dictator. Um, so I cannot enter my country um, by any means. Um, I'm still... Um, um, I would be detained if I enter my country. <coughs> I always listen to news and I know that the situation is extremely bad. Um, I don't know if I'm of help to those who still live in Syria, but at least I can feel that I can be closer and hear more. And at any moment, maybe, maybe I could go back and I could help for me, it is it's like what Muna said a while ago. I 
I cannot live or have a normal day. Um, I do not want to live the normalcy of my previous life. I'm not interested anymore in what I was interested before 10 years ago. As long as my country is not doing well, I am not doing well. And I will always try to do as much as I can um, for my country. And this really um, relieves me and gives me comfort and soothes me because I know at least I'm trying to do something um, for the people of my country. I do think that um, we who live in Lebanon, we do not live far away. Uh, I work together with um, other Syrians and Lebanese and um, I'm close to my family and I do feel also that they are close to me this I'm in a situation where I'm able to give those people without um, expecting um, much of a return the situation in Syria is extremely difficult um, you always think, do they have electricity or not? Sometimes they only have um, electricity for two hours. Do they have clean drinking work, work, uh, water? Um, do they have heating? Um, you cannot ask anyone in Syria, how are you doing? Because people are really not doing well. It is more it's shaming um, to ask people, how do you do? It is difficult uh, to just uh, tell um, people about normal things one does in his daily life, like um, just go out uh, to for a walk or shop or go to the supermarket. The simplest things are a bit shameful to share with those who live in Syria. Um, I always think that when we live here in Lebanon, it's more like uh, being on standby. Uh, it is maybe um, we reduce our suffering and maybe it's a bit more secure than in Syria, than being in Syria. So we need to um, go for new experiments. Uh, we need to make the best of this time so as not to feel that we're losing time so that when we can go back, we're able to go back with full hands and not with empty hands, hands that can build the country again. I. I feel sometimes that my country has become very far away from me and that it is very difficult to go back, but I have not lost the hope. Maybe it's not hope, but I do dream. Mohammed, could I add something? Yes, go ahead. I just wanted to mention in connection with what Ola stated that I would like to have a natural life, a normal life. And this is a correct statement for all of us, but it is impossible under the regimes that we are living on. But as a matter of fact, I, my wish is to live normal life. I would like to go back to continue for my work at plan for the future, but all this had to be postponed because there is more demanding and the more uh, issues are more urgent for me and for people who live here so that we could reach a point relatively better than what we have now in which we could dream of having a normal life but but i have i have no idea how could i imagine here uh, living in egypt what the syrians feel regarding what they have but i do believe that all of us all of us being meaning than all arabs all the revolution that we are living uh, through it we still hope to have uh, to live in safety and in humanly uh, you say that uh, you are against your own nature you became an activist uh, the first question is uh, uh, addressed to rami khoeli in tunisia and uh, someone writes that you rami you are talking about uh, uh, that uh, the uh, Nahda revolution or wanted to wanted to um, be conservative. However, the head of the movement, the head of the movement in Tunisia is a sectarian woman and a non Islamist. She doesn't put a veil on. Thank you for the question because the question, the Nahda, the the the. the uh, Nahda was uh, considered as uh, an Islamist movement uh, and, and uh, was uh, having the head of the municipality uh, from this uh, Nahda movement. Uh, this is this a result of the effort of the civil society, the civil society in the area. 
uh, had to go through in order in, uh, on the on the municipal elections level uh, the resulted with it so you would see that a lot of head of the municipalities in Tunisia are women uh, unveiled women and uh, this is a reality but but the, the Islamist uh, would be become aware that uh, in order to improve their image uh, within uh, in front of the international so international uh, scene uh, they should uh, work with women who are unveiled and that don't belong structurally to the movement and not the movement but they be in but in municipalities or ministries uh, government governmental agencies in order just to add a more positive window dressing for them. But as a matter of fact, another movement had had a serious uh, uh, effort uh, in order to go back with with the, the constitution and the, what their formula uh, formulation of the constitution is really scary hair raising it is worse than the current egyptian the current Egyptian constitution and the current other Arab uh, constitutions uh, and the large segments of uh, the uh, the population uh, even more so than the time during the revolution came, came, came openly against the al nahda movement. There is another question that I could address to Mona, but it is uh, to the rest of you. If you would like to comment, uh, you are welcome. Someone asks about the role of the social media uh, role. I think Mona, you have, uh, tens of thousands of followers. I here in, in Germany, I write and I have two, two followers. You, Mona, you have your thousands of what is what is the specific role of the social media maybe in a campaign, a campaign aimed at uh, uh, setting your brother and sister free. Well, well let me start of the cuff by telling you that the social media certainly had a large role, effective role in everything that happened since we started until this point. At the end of the day, it is a networking opportunities and what you could see and tell, you could see on the report. At the beginning, we did use, we did use this as, as a, an instrument in order to to network with other groups and they would decide we, would we move on the 25th or the 28th and we uh, would uh, call asking for help medical help or other at the beginning i used to write uh, in arabic and in the, and then i switch to english because at the time the, we wanted to report to the outside world what was happening in us and then uh, or then uh, start, beginning on the 2011, our uh, our uh, clashes became with the military uh, uh, clique, the regime, and then the Islamists. And so we wanted to develop in order to reach a larger audience inside of Egypt and the rest of the world, and uh, in order to be able to present a specific narrative in the public space that takes our voice and our story to to what the other media was presenting. At that point under the CC rule, I think that was the only space available to us to be activists. We were unable to do anything on the ground, uh, any, any, any uh, political movement that like, like the demonstrations or walk out on the street would be dealt with, with the highest level of violence. And so we, uh, we, we try to, we try to support other activities with the working, but under uh, fear. And when my sister was sent to Torah, Torah uh, uh, for a letter, they came us and they aggressed us, abused us, and they increased the level of violence against us. So the level of communication between such institutions, uh, of course, 
the government used to oppress and to uh, to uh, hit uh, on those uh, uh, the citizen trying to do anything what we were left with were only the social social media in order to be to present our point of view in order to communicate in order to be able to orchestrate our efforts in everything from for talking, talking about the juristic jurisprudence uh, up to the oxygen cylinders uh, lacking in hospitals during this epidemic because the government dealing with this is uh, uh, faulty and the so and so uh, the citizens would resort to any available or any alternative post in order in order to be able to succeed in their efforts. Yeah. Rami is going to have to add in just a simple comment here. Uh, comment on on the, uh, the social media. I would like to add here that there may be differences between the movement, but the, the major difference here was the very far reaching and the spread uh, uh, the usage of uh, social media in order to uh, continue our efforts. However, maybe at the, currently at this time, the social media uh, instruments have been penetrated have been penetrated by financial interest who became aware of the effectiveness of such means and in order to be able to manipulate the public opinion and and, and to use it to reach its political agenda yeah, but we were talking about uh, about the feminist movement during the uh, the Syrian revolution on facebook could you comment briefly on this and the, on the role of the role currently today uh, uh, the role that uh, the social media uh, uh, you know uh, mechanism uh, uh, have in order to uh, transmit the picture of uh, the Syrian. At the beginning, there was Facebook, and the Facebook was a basic instrument for us in order, in order to open a forum for discussion among us and among all the movements. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, no matter uh, how simple uh, it was, uh, there were discussions and uh, the risk analysis and uh, and uh, so everything we used to take care of to happen on Facebook. But I would like to add you something that the role using using the social media instrument is a two-edged sword. Number one, it's going to give you larger spaces and a lot of liberty and maybe a lot of safety. But when you focus exclusively on it and they keep it only as the only space available to you to express and to prepare your campaigns for advocacy and for discussion that is the danger here that is the negative point as what happened to us in the during the revolution if we reach something simple simple a case in point is that starting in 2000 12 in in, in a, a, my my town a small town we use the facebook and we try to support it me personally i have seen it and i try to support the efforts that a lot of people participate and and in order to organize organize demonstrations, uh, opposition demonstrations for five minutes or 10 minutes in order to walk in silence in the streets. And uh, everything that we organized here was presented in Facebook. We did it twice and uh, three times and we were uh, a few limited number of people. And then we were surprised we were surprised about how large the number of people who did co participate with us in our efforts and the walks and marches, not even having access, having had access to uh, Facebook. At that point, I became aware uh, to be uh, that non-active people, negative people, people who don't usually use the uh, uh, social media form and the, the groups the groups who have a certain taste, you need to understand 
you need to get a feeling and understand what interest would bring people down to the street. And I do believe that the social uh, social uh, media is very suitable for uh, in, in order to organize the, uh, and the galvanize groups for us us as groups, but not to the masses in the street. So so we there will be a lot of open spaces here that I um, could not invest into them. And I do believe that this is dangerous because, because people who come down to the street not to, to, to discuss and not because they are being supported and not because an advocacy campaign, they just come, come out of free will under the spur of the moment. And we ask ourselves, what brought these large numbers of people to the streets? And so where did we uh, acted wrong and acted correctly? Using the social media, I, I, I do believe that using it exclusively will minimize our effectiveness. And I, I ask the question, who, why only Hawaii people, people activists will go to uh, prisons uh, while a lot of people are still talking. I see that uh, a lot of people in our societies know who are the movers and who are the drivers behind groups of people, not who writes and not who discusses or who does the research, etc. I do believe that these people will be targeted in order to demobilize, in order to deactivate the movement of the masses. I do believe that, that they, they, they are observing these people who are involved into the real movement, the real uh, industry. I don't want to focus. I am not for focusing only on social media instruments. So you say, you say that it's one of more that in Cairo, for example, uh, you go out the street, a tank will come and crush you, so you will die. However, in other countries, it could be in other countries, or several other countries, you cannot go down to the street. And that's an important point to, to keep in mind. We have a lot of questions from the audience and uh, you can keep, continue question. I am going to come back to such questions now. I would like to go fully to Diana Bristley from France. Uh, she is a painter and a caricaturist, a Syrian living in France. Yala, welcome. Welcome, Yala. Can you hear me? Yala, thank you so very much for the interesting uh, drawings that you uh, presented to us that uh, helps, helps in clarifying and in uh, complementing the stories of our guests here. I had the feeling that we were talking while we were talking when oh, I, I write the text and you do the drawings. Uh, and I had the, the, the feeling that Ola Al Jundi, the story of Ola Jundi did affect, did impact you a lot. Here is a Syrian woman, a strong Syrian woman who did, did uh, fight and continue to fight for the refugees. So, could you could you share with us uh, the effect? how how did how did your feelings complete on this? Yes, um, I think that um, Ola's story has affected me um, deeply because um, there are many things in common. Um, we had the same path. We had this went the same, took the same walk in life. Uh, walk of life. Um, I also lived in Beirut. I um, worked for two years um, with refugees in refugee camps. I'm not related or do not work in the field of education, but I also decided that I should use um, art um, to support alternative education in refugee camps. And I think um, we met very briefly once, maybe it were only five minutes. And Lebanon is very small as a country anyway. Um, yes, and uh, it was a coincidence. I went to Lebanon to start an initiative to do um, wall drawings in refugee camps so that I may encourage children to go back to schools. The schools there are 
really very simple schools. Um, they're mainly made up of tents and not really structural physical buildings. Um, I now live in France and I try from time to time to um, send wall paintings. I draw them on canvas, very big canvas and send them over. I decided to draw on canvas and to send it um, as a means of support. You used to um, draw for a children's magazine, Zaytuna Zaytuna, while you were living in Syria, and you were also working on um, sketches and arts while you were living in Lebanon, and now you live in France. Can you describe to us briefly um, your work abroad? Um, how is your work as an artist when you live so far away from your country, from Syria, from maybe so many issues that um, move you and that have something to do with the um, children, especially um, of those children, refugee children, such as um, the children Ola works with. Um, to be honest, um, I, I'm generally interested in issues um, of general interest in the Arab region, but I'm also interested in the issues um, related to children living in Syria. Um, a long time ago, I used to work on uh, children's books and not on politics while I was working in Syria. I miss that kind of work, but um, uh, now I'm drawing a destruction. I'm an artist and drawing um, images of destruction, unfortunately. Um, I am also very far away. I'm not as close as Ola is. I do not live close to the borders of Syria, but I cannot detach myself. Um, surely, um, certainly I could. Um, there is a lot of rejection inside us um, to let go. Um, we do feel responsible. We started um, and walked on this path. We took this path. And since we did not achieve anything politically, I think at least what we can do is to um, help the children who paid the price of what we have started politically. I always have this feeling that we started a revolution and we could not follow through with it and we did not achieve anything. And there's are these... There's so many children who have lost their future and the least what we can do is to support those children. I have this feeling, Ola, that you might want to comment on what um, was just said um, because we were just talking about a similar topic. Um, maybe uh, we're talking about the achievements and gains of the revolutions, but Diala, thank you very much for your drawings and sketches. And we do hope that we, um, that we may be able to see one another more and more. Um, good evening, back to you to France, and thanks a lot for participating. I still have a few questions that were posted by the audience. Here's a question on the term Arab Spring. Um, when I um, when I wrote um, the scroll story, I tried to um, take distance from this term because I don't really like it. But um, the question is, do you actually feel this uh, feeling of spring while you're actually living um, in winter time, so to speak? To me, um, spring is really a strange term to use. And then uh, even more strange, I find the combination between spring and Arab uh, spring. So um, there are also um, so many minorities and different cultures and ethnic groups such as the Amazigh and the Kurds and the Nubans. So it's not just an Arab matter. Is there anyone who would like to comment on the term Arab spring? Maybe the term Arab Spring was mainly maybe coined um, with Arab uh, Spring Spring as an indication that there was a lot of injustice and um, suppression and 
that um, most people maybe are considered Arabs, but that is um, not true. Um, it, whether it's a spring, um, autumn, or summer, or winter, it's still an ongoing process. It's not one season. In Tunisia, we're also still um, a revolution in process, despite we are always regarded as a successful example um, for the revolutions, but the endemic corruption in the country um, um, has not been eliminated. On the contrary, it has even increased in Tunisia. Um, the economic and social rights have not been really achieved or attained, and there has not been even a successful um, approach or vision on how to achieve these rights and how to eliminate um, corruption and fight against it effectively. Um, all these factors resulted in a strong return of what is similar to the old regimes. Um, since one year now, um, we feel that the current regime is closer to the old regime and not to the one that we have wished after the revolution. If there had been um, elections tomorrow, there would be um, there would be one party who would have the majority win during these elect elections. So the revolution. This is what people say the revolution brought to us hunger and more problems and only very few gains. So to get back to your question, it is very difficult to judge whether we are in the springtime of the revolution. We need more time. Um, there are a lot of reactions that we need to deal with and handle. Um, I'm talking about Tunisia, but there is a lot for us to work on to, um, to prevent uh, the return to authoritarian um, uh, regimes and systems. First, I would like to say, um, if this is spring, then the springtime in Egypt is a really dreadful season. Um, it's really not a nice season to live in. Um, I would like to say that, as is the case in any revolution, there are terms that try to describe um, superficially this revolution. Um, there, at some point, it was the Arab Spring, then the Facebook revolution. It's very, very um, superficial. And those who look from outside get the feeling that the things are only um, made um, easier to be consumed as revolutions. There is um, there was space to promote the momentum. So there's the Arab Spring, there's the Facebook uh, revolution. So let us just um, uh, move on this terminology and the names we give to these processes was not really important. So they had the Fridays of anger and it is as if it is a PR mechanism or a branding of that, what is really happening on the ground. And it is only partially related to what really happened on the ground. There is, um, uh, um, interference from abroad by um, external players. Um, eventually, it's a very limited space and it does not at all reflect the reality on the ground. Um, at the beginning of 2011, I, it drove me crazy when I was asked about the role of Facebook and this insisting on um, turning activists like I used to consider myself one, that um, all oh, those are people from the upper middle class, they do speak English, to, um, to make symbols of us for the revolution, while um, those who paid the highest price for uh, the revolution or in the re revolutions were always those who were um, socially, socially marginalized and it were the young people in general. I doubt 
that you will find anyone who lives here um, who names this revolution um, Arab Spring. These are names that are given from outside and um, we are also we also fight on other names like uh, the um, um, the National Day of Police Forces or um, so there's a lot of discussion between the people from the different um, uh, strata and um, who participate in the revolution. Um, Muna, you also commented on the Arab Spring. I have another question to you. Someone asks if you could Please describe more your work, Ola. How do you work at school? Is there a um, specific institution you work with? Do you receive foreign funding? Um, what is it you work on with the children at school? I just want to comment on the issue of the name Arab Spring. The Arab Spring and the Arab Winter, it has become like a joke for us. It has a lot of poetic rhetoric, uh, but what we did are real revolutions. We aimed for real change and we wanted to attain our rights through these revolutions. And we did not think about anything related to um, poetry or um, any romantic rhetoric. Um, it is very important to explain to people that it is not so important what we feel, it is important what we learn and what we know, the knowledge we gain through the process of those revolutions. We analyze the results of what we do and do a deep analysis of internal ex and external factors that um, impact our process. Um, it is very important to create a popular narrative because people um, really feel that they have lost everything. And when you ask someone, why are you here? Um, what did you lose? They tell you, oh, because of the revolution. We have been displaced because of the revolution. This is a narrative that we need to face. We were displaced because we had been oppressed. Um, we, I think and I believe that this is something important that we need to be very much aware of. Um, regarding the work I do and we do, we started with a school, um, we started in a small tent and then we moved on and moved into a small center nearby. Um, our, my son moved to Sweden and I have a residency in Sweden, but I did not go because I preferred to stay in Lebanon because I felt this is the place where I should be, that my place should be there where my people are and uh, where people need our efforts. Um, we work with children. Um, it is not just alternative education. What we do is formal education because at the um, eventually at the end of a uh, school year, um, the children do receive the school certificates which are recognized by the state. We work with a small number of children because our capacities are only uh, limited. We are not uh, huge institutions. We do not put a lot of effort into always working on fundraising and drafting reports. What we do is we focus on quality and the quality of teaching, even if um, only a small group of children benefit from this. This is a sort of education and teaching that reflects um, our principles, those that guide us through the revolution, uh, the feeling of digni dignity. Um, so in addition to that, we also work together with the entire family of the child. We do not work with the child alone and we don't just look at um, the materials. Uh, we don't teach just um, mathematics or um, language. What we do is we do a comprehensive approach. We teach the children on children's rights, on human rights, so that we sensitize them for the importance of defending our rights. Um, for example, 20 days ago, we wanted to appoint a new teacher for uh, mathematics. Um, and of usually to appoint someone, uh, we take the CV or people would usually take the CV and do an interview. But what we did, we added another layer on top of that. And we gave the children the right to vote for the teacher. So the 
So the applicants um, gave um, classes and then the children voted. And uh, so after they gave the classes for to the children, the children had the right to vote um, which teacher they preferred and which one they would like to see appointed. And um, and then they wanted to have the old teacher back. And so we had a long discussion over one hour about what does it mean to have a democratic discussion? And then they told us we do not want any one of those new teachers. We want our old teachers. So we used this opportunity to tell them about um, how people apply um, qualifications, um, uh, uh, discussions, democratic processes. Um, we also include the parents, so we um, do constructive education so that um, this, the constructive education that the child receives at our school may be completed and continued by the parents at home. So we work with the parents, we work with the women. We also have other projects on um, um, uh, building the capacity of women, but um, the entire funding of uh, the European uh, Union um, unfortunately uh, flows through the Lebanese um, government and Lebanon and I think this is the worst that um, the funders and donors could have done to the formal education sector. It is not even beneficial to the Lebanese so imagine um, that it is not beneficial at all for um, Syrian children, if anyone would like to support us, um, we are registered in Sweden and sometimes we have uh, fundraising campaigns and um, um, all funding is used um, on education. Thank you, Ola. Um, so maybe we can say that you're planting the seeds of the revolution in the younger generation. There are three same questions to Rami Khouili. What is happening right now in Tunisia? There are protests. Rami, could you just uh, briefly um, analyze what is going on in Tunisia these days? Truly, it is very difficult to answer this question because the events are just happening and ongoing now. We need to be modest in answering um, this question and at looking at things. Um, it has to do with disappointment, young people being disappointed after 10 years of revolution. The only change that they felt was that the head of the regime and the government um, there was a change in the president um, and that there are elections every five day, uh, years and that they can vote every five years, but they do not hear that the true change has taken place. Uh, nothing that um, affected their daily lives, their dealings with the regime, with the authority, but nothing happened in their view. And, there has been this accumulation of this disappointment that now um, is breaking out and these different governments um, that um, have come to govern Tunisia since 2011, all of them failed in delivering the promises and uh, to meet the demands of the uh, revolution that had been initially posed. Um, also, the role of the um, state is diminishing and uh, ooh, ooh, the only thing that remains is really um, the security forces, um, which are to be found in all places, but otherwise uh, the role of the state is diminishing in the um, basic service delivery and education and health and the young people who are out on the streets right now who are mainly teenagers you one needs to understand that the education system in Tunisia in Tunisia reports on 100,000 young people who drop out of the education system before attaining their degrees. This is one of the main challenges um, facing the Tunisian government, how to deal with the situation, how to offer alternative chances and opportunities to these 
youth who drop out of the education system. So modestly, um, I find it very difficult to comment on what is going on right now because um, these protests are still ongoing and um, very young. There is also a question on the role of um, European donors and um, maybe also um, on foreign policy. Um, in Germany, there will be um, elections in September. Um, according to some polls, we might have um, foreign minister of um, the Green Party, what, um, who might be considered very progressive. What would be your message to um, this German minister and what is it you expect from Germany in support of your um, visions and revolutions? I just wanted to um, say that one of the main issues that come to my mind is the support of European and maybe US government and an unconditional support to the, to the government um, headed by CC is um, disturbing, especially um, in light of the, um, uh, of the, the role and the way um, the regime is functioning. Um, we try to free ourselves from the brutal um, dictatorship. And, but um, we do not see that we have enough support um, to face um, all these challenges and um, working on issues related to our detention centers and to hold um, awareness campaigns and to um, um, and to fight against uh, arbitrary detentions and um, fake trials. We have been now in two, for two years. Our, we see that all activist detainees are accused of terrorism. My brother is accused of terrorism, my sister as well. The situation is really bad. And European governments do support the current regime. What do you mean by European governments support the regime? Just a very um, short example, a small example. Uh, when a Sisi um, visited uh, France, um, he was he was um, handed a reward in Paris while there were even protests in Paris against Sisi and the brutality of his regime and his um, crackdown of the um, dissidents and opposition in um, Egypt. In Germany, for example, deals um, on arms are still being handled between um, or negotiated between Germany and Egypt. Um, and there were news that there has been a new deal um, for um, more to sell arms to Egypt. So um, all of these uh, negotiations and uh, deals of uh, delivering and selling selling arms to um, the regime of Sisi is supporting him, despite him committing. Um, these crimes against his own people, the Egyptian people. And it does matter to us, these deals and these negotiations and these fake projects at the end of the people who pay the price of it because um, we, our country is in debt to an extent that even generations following ours will still be in debt for many, many years. So I think many countries uh, need to understand that um, trade um, deals with Egypt are um, in support of the regime and are not um, supporting the activists. But for three or four years, I was here in Berlin and the SCC, the Egyptian president, they came as a guest to Mrs. Merkel. And in a press meeting, the SCC looked at Mrs. Merkel and they said, I can send you 90 million refugees. Uh, uh, tongue in cheek, uh, sarcastically. Well, that's a part of the system uh, as uh, 
the system uses two main things. Number one, terrorism, and uh, number two, fear, uh, fear of the foreign European countries uh, that uh, they will be subject to receiving a lot of refugees. These two instruments are being manipulated in order to uh, affect people. the West. Uh, 7,000 doctors left Egypt during the pandemic and they came to Egypt. This is statistics and I would like I, I would like to uh, underline the idea that uh, doctors can go without borders anywhere. But the fact is that what we have in Egypt is that uh, these countries are lack stability and the, the only way in order to get things in order is that uh, you, uh, you, get, uh, you get better life and you get better spaces for people and this is not going to happen uh, not is not going to happen without uh, stopping the support uh, to the uh, government uh, and the so activists activists would uh, affect the uh, behavior of their leaders in order to stop this thank you Mona, and i would like to add something here and ask the same question in a lot of european capitals people talk about opening diplomatic doors and you to the assad regime in syria the discussion uh, takes place here in Germany. Uh, however, it is uh, limited and uh, it exists also in uh, France. What uh, is your take on this? Frankly, what Mona said and talked, she said that she used to write in Arabic and then she switched it to English so that people could uh, follow her up. I do believe I, uh, people would say, uh, what difference does it make? We know what is the situation of the international community and the, and the countries that to do intervenes directly in the civil uh, current civil war in Syria, which brought us brought us to this to this very difficult situation that we face uh, right now. Uh, I think that. Uh, we need to know seriously. We need to talk to governments. So we need to deal with governments. Uh, I don't know what theory is this uh, that uh, uh, governments, governments uh, the world over uh, support uh, human dignity and the human rights. But I do believe that we need to keep informing everyone that there is no peace no peace would continue or prevail in the world with the importance of such large quantities of armaments and the dominance of capital which happened which happens to be deeper than the work of any government anywhere in the world you know this huge amount of armaments and dumping them on markets they they it, they are they are meant for people to kill each other and not for hunting. And this is a basic question that I would like to look at. Don't talk about peace while, and at the same time, we are talking about the huge amounts of armaments and weaponry being produced and exported. I also do think that no one, no one would reach a point in which they can stop crises. I am not talking about refugees. Turkey, Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, and they, they, they threaten that they are going to open doors for the refugees. This is not the problem. The real problem is that the points, humanity would pay the price uh, as, a, as a totality, one way or another. Uh, thanks. Thank you so very much, Rami. Would you talk about a similar subject when we talked about the file back in 2011, there was support of the French government to the Ben Ali regime. And you would see it on the file and written text. And you are an expert in the French or European, European Tunisian, uh, European Mediterranean relation. What is your take on this subject? Uh, thanks, Mohammed. The, the colleagues here did cover, did cover a, a lot of grounds. Uh, 
Uh, maybe just a comment or, or, or an addition to what is the role of the European Union in the area with the existence of a new regional power in the area that uh, has a lot of influence and a lot of power to, in the daily life and the, the daily uh, reality like Turkey, China, however, how far it is, other, other countries, uh, foreign players that come and have practiced their influence in the area. And so they have the financial capability and or other, other countries who have both military as well as financial capabilities to intervene. And the example here as a case in point would be bit The only, uh, the only uh, reply from, from the French government is that they offered safety support to the Tunisian government in order, in order to combat the demonstration on how to deal with the demonstration, which points out to the fact that unfortunately, a lot of the European, European countries I do believe that the only solution to the current problems in the area being the Arab world in order to stop and curb immigration to Europe is to support military as well as politically to the uh, government. Thank you, Rami. And I would like just to comment simply that in 2013 or 14, I was in Tunisia. I was at the parliament and I was asked by one, one member, member and they said, if I tell them that I am going to stop and the curb immigration, would they pay me more? I said, yes, just to say this, and you are going to get a lot of money. What we have now, some questions here, a specific question to Ola and Mona about the role of the, the uh, feminist dialogues and the feminist activists uh, in the revolution in Egypt and Syria, maybe Rami can also, can also add to this, but what, what uh, is the role of the feminist movement and, and what took place in the last 10 years? Ola, do you have your mic on, Ola? I am waiting, I am waiting for Mona. Frankly, uh, at the beginning, for me, for us, for our area, and I thought I did mention that our area is a little bit different, and we try to use our different identities uh, and the orientations. We try to use. Uh, we try to present ourselves as, as not, not. Uh, a certain sect or not a certain group that people say that the system, the regime is an Alawi regime and we are, we are facing this regime and the fighting is what we wanted to clarify the thing we said, we, we, are, we are minority, we are different, we look different and we are able we are, we have are multidisciplinary, we are multi identity men and women with different political views and identities, and this is what we manage to do. I do believe and I do consider that those working in in in, in this practice is a part of the revolution, a part of the change. We would go through crisis and go to a very difficult situation, but every uh, process of change and every revolution in the world would face crises and would face uh, points of excessive difficulty. I do believe that the feminist discussion and the feminist view and the perspective to politics is an important thing. It would give us hope that how 
could we learn? How could we learn from what we did in the past and from what we are trying to do? And that is something that we see uh, among ourselves and we see that uh, we are trying to build a new identity for the change. Uh, I don't, uh, feminist, I, not to use the existing one, but to build on the existing one. Mona is going to add now. There are a lot of things, 2011 opened the door too, uh, and the, the things and the issues that we need to comment on and we need to engage at. If someone if one, uh, following this process would know that one of the most important things that happened in 2011 for uh, women is that there was, there was a tendency to marginalize the feminist the feminist role in the revolution and the feminist existing uh, uh, organizations. So for anything in terms of what the women suffered in terms of abuse, aggression during, during what happens uh, in the street, they say this is not uh, nothing of importance, nothing of priority now. And they kept this, this view, kept kept in place and they kept moving. However, the, the government, the government wanted to capitalize on the existence of female existence and, and they, used, they used the mass abuse and the sexual abuse against the girls. So, so this, this forced people to create sort of protection for women for women who move uh, or who keep membership in this movement. One of the things that I do believe that it happened since January 25th, and even though, even though it came in a difficult point that we are living through three years now, as if women in Egypt, women in Egypt are totally out of the picture. The role and their issues were totally marginalized, mar kept it down. And, the, the, and the, when we talk about gender and the gender issues and the, and the LGBT the, uh, groups and all other uh, similar uh, minorities, this this have been eliminated now, and they are not. They have no grounds more. So for the last two or three years, so one one of the most important issues among us here in the civil society, not not vis a vis the states, but among us, is the the feminist issues and women's issues, and the the governments. The government increases increases uh, the conservative role, and they target women. And we have for one year now the uh, uh, the, the minister of justice now has started a campaign in order to arrest women, arrest women, a lot of women, under the the, the umbrella, false umbrella of protecting the families uh, in Egypt. And we have women women who 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 uh, were witnesses. Uh, in, in, in issues uh, for uh, sons of businessmen who converted uh, uh, in different, in different, uh, different view. The role has been increasing against this uh, in, in using, using the uh, general attorney, minister of justice and the, the government, uh, the public opinion, the public media, public media focus on this in order to, to uh, support uh, support the role of their own vision of conservative uh, uh, family role. What is acceptable? What is not acceptable? So women who are being uh, disgraced in the in the government uh, uh, run media, uh, girls and women who are activists on Facebook or you know, other. And other area, they ruined their lives totally. So there is a process of escalation in that that the, the government uses excessively and increasingly these things against women, which is a stunning among women, especially the younger younger generation than mine. They don't say this is not important. They want to say this is not a priority. We are going to talk, we are going to 
who are going to become active and any group who claims that it is progressive and it is going to uh, become active are not going, going to put the finger on uh, the role as priority. I do believe that it is quite important point uh, and uh, it is going to open the door for dialogue for us here, a very different dialogue. And I hope I hope that it will continue on the lines of what's happening now. Mona, you uh, you did uh, answer another question about uh, the, the role of a conservative society, conservative segment in Egypt in this. I do believe that Rami, I know you are an activist uh, supporting supporting the roles of of uh, gender minorities and uh, feminist minorities. Could you please? Uh, clarify the issue in Tunisia. Maybe it is the same thing that you have heard to now is also in Tunisia. The only difference could be that from the beginning that there were a lot of force uh, uh, on the part of the government in combating this. We, we did not see we did not see, of course, uh, there was harassment and there was sexual harassment, but not as uh, tough and as uh, bad as happened in other countries. Uh, starting 2011, women existed in the street, uh, and this is because there were uh, women's movement and the feminist movement in Tunisia well structured and they had the ability to network and the ability to organize uh, and the work. The biggest difference that we have seen to you through the last 10 years is that the sexually different groups, LGTP, and they were, they were not present at all. And many, many persons, members and the activists who belonged to these LGBTQ groups did participate in the revolution but uh, starting 2015, they, they used the public space and we did talk a while ago, a while ago about the role. There is a strong presence in Tunisia for, uh, for the LGBTQT uh, Q groups. LGBTIQ, uh, uh, that, that uh, uh, the issue that the people look at them at is non-important, non non-vital. So let us focus on other priorities and let us uh, focus on political priority, economic, political, social, political, uh, human dignity, political. But uh, I do say that all such issues are, are just as important. And it is as a public motto. Uh, uh, the, the different movements, the different movements, uh, uh, feministism, social, uh, other social, other social movements. There are a lot, a lot of issues that became clearer, more clear with the time. Thank you. We still have 18 uh, minutes before we end up, and I have a question for Mona. Mona, unfortunately, Mona, you are an expert in working with uh, the, the Egyptian uh, justice system, particularly the Egyptian judicial system. Could you describe to us uh, how the Egyptian uh, justice system works, uh, particularly taking the case of Sana, your uh, sister, and Abdel Fattah, your brother? Of course, I can tell you a lot about this. We have been now for years. Oh, let me say, we know how much the government institutions um, are um, not independent of the general system and the regime. But to say the truth, what we see is that in um, these times, um, the dealings um, exceed imagination. Let me say, for example, maybe people who are listening right now do not know about our situation. My sister, for example, was abducted by the security forces at the public prosecutor's office when we went there to fight charges against a criminal offense. 
that is an offense offense or an event that whatever you imagine uh, your the imagination can't get um to such a, a bad scenario um she might be detained yes we might be beaten up yes but so but that someone is abducted while on her way to press charges in front of the prosecutor's office um, that means that we are at a moment where civilians are not protected um, by um, institutions. These institutions do not fulfill even the minimum of the role assigned to them. So um, those who have detained um, and the family, um, family members who are detained, who want to press charges, um, that has become a very difficult path. The institutions have um, become instruments in the hands of the regime and the security forces. Um, there is some sort of legal coverage on um, this alliance between the institution and the interests of the regime. There is uh, the code or the provisions of the code against a uh, demonstrations and um, so the interpretation of the provisions of codes are also left um, open to the security forces so um, one can be accused of terrorism for the simplest reason and um, all the accusations and charges are similar um, to um, promote fake news, uh, terrorist um, views um, of being a terrorist, um, what are the accusations? What is the evidence? There is no evidence provided at any point in time. And since um, people are never allowed to look into indictments or um, bills of indictment or um, the documents or files, so um, eventually one hopes that our cases are dealt before judges in the courts of law. But what, yes, exactly, but um, for example, there is the issue of um, investigative custody. Um, people um, cannot be just um, be kept in investigative custody. There are provisions on how to handle this. Of course, um, there are a lot of um, um, uh, exceptions that are being practiced or um, the current institutions are using the term recycling. So recycling of detainees, this is very normal. So once one is released of um, investigative custody, one is released, then you're being brought again before um, the prosecutor's office, and then um, you're being charged with new offenses and all that without any legal basis or without proper investigation or um, even evidence. So the it is only um, exercising pressure. This is what the institutions do. They exercise pressures on citizens. So they look at what has the citizen done in the past so they can use this against the citizen to detain, to detain him or her. So the number of people who are being detained is beyond belief. Um, it is not that one necessarily needs to um, to commit an offense, one does not really need to do much to be detained. The situation is um, very bad and um, we really find that the judiciary has failed at all levels and um, all the institutions of, uh, all state institutions are only serving the interests of national security forces. There is a question on the role of the communities that live abroad in supporting what goes on in the on the ground in the countries. Um, for example, the, the Tunisian community abroad, um, its role in affecting what is going on in Tunisia on the ground and the same applying for Egypt and Syria. Ola, please. Generally, Speaking, one of some one of the things that has happened early on is that there has been, of course, a lot of interference. I decided for myself when I left in 2013 that I do not follow any um, activism that has to do with the revolution while I am outside of Syria, but. 
now I feel that um, that the community outside um, has a big role to play, even in support and in solidarity. Um, there's a lot of remittances that are being sent uh, to the people inside or um, family members, um, wherever they are. The economic situation is disastrous. Um, no one is really um, able to live a life. Um, during the last movements that happened during uh, the protests in Sueda, um, beginning of the year, um, some slogans were raised again that we saw in the early beginnings of the revolution, such as the Syrian people is one. I saw that because I was one of those being abroad, I was in Sweden, um, I saw that the people who were abroad really um, were um, revitalized. They uh, took energy from seeing what is going on inside. I think that without the movements inside, the people who are outside of the country only see few chances for them to organize and to offer something such as educating others, um, it's a space that should be used when one does not live inside Syria. It needs to be used to the best. And on a daily basis, we need to understand the space we are in right now. How did we come here? Um, why did we end up being here? And how do we use the space we're in right now? Rami, um, just a very quick comment from you because there is another, or Mona, please. I see that one of the, a key role of the community abroad in general is, I'm not sure how to say it, is, is, but maybe to document what is happening. Here we do not have the time. The, the developments are many and there's so much to do here, even at the personal level, um, at the community level here inside. So one of one of the key roles for the community abroad is to document what is happening because they can take it a bit slower and they can also have a better look at the moment that we are living in. And um, also um, the media also covers up entirely out on what is happening on the ground in Egypt. So there is alternative media that helps us to keep the eyes open on what is really going on on the ground. Rami did not have any comment to add. Um, okay, as a moderator, um, me as a Moroccan, um, maybe I had something to say on Morocco, but um, unfortunately now I will not. Um, there is a question posted by several from the audience. Um, do you expect new revolutions to happen or will the revolutions continue as they started in 2011? Maybe it's a difficult question, but if any one of the three of you would like to comment. Very quickly, I think that um, judging that the revolution has ended, whether be it in Tunisia or elsewhere, is, is, um, not, um, uh, is not a judgment that we um, can just accept like this. There are lots of events and developments that still make us believe that the revolutions are ongoing. Um, activities and movements are ongoing and we're all still in the process of the of continuing with the revolution um, year after year the revolution has not ended not in tunisia maybe we are now on a more political um, transition um, track in tunisia but it does not mean that the revolution is over when does a revolution end? It ends when we um, claim and we um, achieve uh, the demands um, that drove the people to the streets in the first place. And those demands have not yet been achieved. And since they have not been achieved, I believe that 
the revolution is still ongoing. Maybe it has taken on different forms, but it is still ongoing. Hola, maybe there, there's a different um, context, the Syrian context. No, I do um, agree to a large extent with what Rami said, um, saying that the re revolution is over. Um, it's difficult because revolution is not just um, a specific form of presence in public spaces or um, ousting a dictator. It is, um, uh, it is something we do on a daily basis. Um, it is protesting, it is building. Um, everything that um, is done, even by civil society inside and outside Syria, and if I say outside Syria, there is also a dynamics to the civil society outside Syria that is changing on a yearly basis and adapting. And that is um, an enrichment to the revolution. This year, for example, what is um, now being disseminated are thoughts on accountability even within the civil society um, inside Syria, being it little or small or big violations, um, there and never ever has been, um, uh, did we see that revolutions anywhere in the world um, achieve the demands of the re revolution immediately? There were always phases and processes. And in Syria right now, uh, we're also in an ongoing process. Um, the problem is that we maybe feel that we're not going anywhere. And I find it problematic, um, this feeling. But as long as we're trying to move, as long as something is happening, uh, be it at the political level or the level of um, um, the the protest movements, um, I do believe that um, staying in motion does have a continuous effect on our lives. I remember in 2015 or 2016, it was being said that we want to negotiate with the regime at a high political level. We want to um, um, negotiate with the regime because we want a political solution. And that's why we need to set aside issues such as um, accountability, but um, it, this was a key matter for the situation in Syria and dealing with it. Um, now there is consensus among activists and politicians. We are already um, within the process of transitional justice, even if it is still very polarized and at very different points. Um, but we do all want a political solution, but to guarantee that not the same violations at the same extent can be repeated. So in parallel, we need to tackle the issue of accountability and um, combine it with our desire for a political solution. A lot has changed in the way we think. We are um, leading discussions on um, who are the foreign players who are affecting um, the events and developments inside Syria. People are changing the way they think. Not everyone is thinking anymore that the external players are also um, 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 having um, a colonial style or colonial um, ideologies and in getting into Syria. Um, we're just on a different trajectory right now of the revolution. Mona, the revolution is ongoing. Inti, are you anyway free to think about a new revolution? No, I just need to apologize if my answer had been very cynical um, or if my answer is going to be very cynical. I also wanted to say that I wish Ola to meet my mother. Um, my mother is also a teacher and there's a lot the two of you have in common in the way you talk, um, the terms you use, and I would really like to connect the two of you to get to know each other. I truly um, see or my motivation to move and to be an activist in this emotion is of course that I see that the revolution is ongoing. Um, of course, there were many moments of defeat that I felt, but um, the current situation does not allow for stagnation. We cannot stay here. This cannot be the status quo. 
the main and basic freedoms um, that we need to live our lives are all um, being under attack by the regime. Uh, the regime of El Sisi in 2020-2021 is very terrifying. Um, it has gone out of control. It is brutal and we cannot predict what may happen in the near future. Um, if I am able to control what happens in my life and plan just one week ahead, then I consider myself very lucky. To say that I deal with the future is a very um, um, uh, is an ambiguous statement because um, no one knows um, exactly what is going to happen in the light of the context we're living in. There are violations. Our rights are being curtailed. Um, the instrumentalization of state institutions and uh, the complete lack of um, of um, of acceptance of um, uh, the basic human needs is, um, is terrifying. If there will be a new revolution, I do not know. What I know for sure is that we cannot accept the status quo, we cannot live the status quo, and I know that each one of us needs to work on bringing about a moment of change what started in 2011 is somehow still present. We're still there. It has not uh, disappeared entirely and we cannot sit and wait for things. We need to work towards things to happen. We need to bring about uh, this change because we do not have any other future unless we bring about change. Thank you very much, Muna. Thank you um, to the audience. I just want to add, please. I just want to tell Muna, when we started in Syria with the revolution in 2011, when the movement started, the situation we were living in was very bad. Um, we didn't even have a space to dream. We didn't feel anything. We were numb. We didn't understand. We didn't feel what it meant um, to be part of a nation, of a country, or to be a citizen. But still, we dreamed and believed in something very abstract. And that was our ability to bring about change. If you ask me what drives me now to go out to be part of a revolution now, I would tell you, I do not know. Um, I only know that I can die. And despite this knowledge, I moved then and I still move today because our dream is still there. So really we need to, maybe we do not need to do anything. You're not obliged to do anything, but this is how we started also we didn't even have a dream we produced our own dream so thank you very much um Ola, i would like um to extend my thanks to the audience i still have 34 questions before we um, before me i cannot pause and um, go into these questions but um there is this link revolutions uh, dot bell dot de um, where we can access you can access this information i would like to thank anya from the heinrich bell foundation the technicians i would like to thank the interpreters uh, the entire technical team who has supported this online event i would like to thank rami khuili olal jundi and muna safe i need to thank also and want to thank diala brisley i you truly are our hope. I know this might sound a bit pathetic, but um, ever since I talked to you, um, my conviction of that the revolutions um, are ongoing um, has been has become even more solid. I do hope that we can at one day share the happiness you might feel when your siblings are released from detention. I also hope that we all meet in person here in Berlin so that we uh, can celebrate achievements. Thank you all very much. Um, Mona, please say hello to your mother. Regards.
Thank you, Rami Muna. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Bye. Too. It was a pleasure working with you.